Bibles and let's go to Job chapter 23. Job chapter number 23 and we're going to just spend some time this morning looking at Job's life and what he went through and some of the things we can glean from that. Job 23. I, I guess many of you have read through the book of Job many times. It's a, it's a good book, a very good book. I used to be scared, just by way of personal testimony, I used to be scared to read the book of Job because I thought that when you read the book of Job, a lot of trials would come in your life. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. But I do know this, that after I got past that fear, um, God used Job in my life to be an encouragement. And he went through a lot, and probably a lot more than most of us ever will. And, but he was faithful, and we can learn a lot from him. So let's read Job 23, and we're going to read from verses... 8 and verse down to verse 12. Job chapter 23 and verse number 8. This is Job speaking. He says, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him, he hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps, his way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Let's read verse 13 and 14 as well. Such a great couple of verses. It says, he is, one, he is in one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. And verse 14, for he performeth the thing that is appointed for me. And many such things are with him. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the day. And thank you for this group of people. And I pray uh, you would set me um, to the point where I am not a hindrance to your word. Uh, let me be just a channel of blessing. Uh, people don't need to hear from Jeremy. They need to hear from your word. And so, God, please speak through me and use me, I pray. And strengthen us this morning as we look at Job and help us to learn some things about his life and what that means for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. By all earthly standards, Job was a very righteous man. He was a very good man. You know, God even pointed him out to Satan um, as someone very special. And Satan, um, obviously, God allowed Satan to touch Job's life. But what we're going to see in this lesson is, you know, how the severest of trials in his life really came to Job and, and what that and how after a period of suffering and questioning God um, that ultimately Job got through that trial and God really blessed him and and the key for that was Job had to humble himself under God's hand and the theme of the lesson is really is really this and I guess it's kind of timely um, given the situation but we, we often go through things we'll go through suffering and trial and we'll wonder why is this happening to me why am I going through a hard time uh, why, why are others suffering? Why is God allowing that in their life? Isn't God a good God? Doesn't he prevent that? Well, some of the people that are lost, they use that as an excuse not to be saved. They say, well, God could really stop a lot of things from happening, but he doesn't. So how can there be a God or how can that God be good? But the reality is that God has a purpose when he allows suffering in our lives. He never does anything by accident, uh, by, by mistake. Everything has purpose. And in fact, if our lives were always just smooth sailing, we probably just get to a point, I know we will, we'll get to a point where we, God, we, we don't need you. We're actually okay, God. We can do life without you. And that's, that's a bad place to be. It's a dangerous place to be. And so what we have to do is we have to grow in our faith as we go through these trials. And if we do that, then it'll be good for us. It'll be good for us. So today we're going to look at Job's testimony. Then we're going to look at his trials. And then we're going to conclude by looking at Job's triumph. Let's first of all consider the testimony of Job. The testimony of Job. First of all, um, let's go back to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. The amazing thing about this testimony is that this is not given by another man, but in fact by God. God himself said this about Job. And so we know it's true. And we know it's, there's no bias. There's no subjectivity to it. It's an objective. It's a true witness. God says this about his servant Job. Job chapter 1 verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. You know, the word perfect is a, 
a word that means complete. It means full. It means finished. Job was a complete man. You know, we're instructed to be perfect, even as our Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Does that mean that I'm meant to be without sin and I cannot make any mistakes and therefore I'm perfect? It doesn't mean that. It just means that I'm mature, I'm complete, and I'm full, I'm finished. God's doing His work in my life. And of course, over time, that, that happens, doesn't it? We, we don't, we're not there just yet. <laughs> so wherever you are, there's still progress to be made. Even if you've been saved a long time, there's still progress in your Christian life that God wants to achieve. But Job was living a life that was perfect. Uh, but secondly, he was, he was upright. Upright is to stand up straight, to, to be honest, to be just, uh, not deviating from the moral principles that are correct. So Job was, a, Job was a godly man. He basically did the right thing. That's what Job did. You know, the, the most simple thing we could just say to ourselves is we just need to do right. We just need to choose what is right. And like someone said, there are two choices on, on the shelf. It's either you're going to please God or you're going to please yourself. So when you wake up in the morning, you're either going to please your flesh or you're going to choose to please God. And it's a daily choice, but it's also a, an hourly choice. And really, in fact, it's moment by moment. I've got to choose. Am I going to do the right thing here? Or am I going to choose to please what my flesh wants and give myself what I want? Job was a man who did right. Um, and, and so then when we read about Job's trials and what he went through, we, we sort of think, well, why? Why did God allow that? He, he mustn't have been punishing Job because Job was doing the right thing. Um, Job, Job had a godly testimony. So why did God allow that? Well, and we sometimes have this thought, well, if I'm living right and I'm doing the right thing, then life is just going to be easy. Life is going to just go smoothly. And I'm not going to suffer. I'm not going to experience difficulty. Well, that's actually not true. God never said that our Christian life was going to be easy. And he never promised that we would not have trials. Um, and sometimes we have those false expectations, which then we start to question God. What God does promise is not that we won't go through trouble, but that he'll give us his grace. We, we do know that. And he will promise his unfailing grace through the trials. This um, writer said, Alfred Edersheim, he wrote this. He said, we cannot understand the meaning of many trials. God does not explain them. To explain a trial would be to destroy its object or its purpose. So if we knew everything about the reasons why the trial happened, that would be to defeat the purpose of that trial. The, the purpose of a trial is ultimately is to call forth simple faith and implicit obedience. That's what God wants to do. He wants us to trust Him. And he wants us to obey Him. And in the annals of Scripture, there's no one who was more tested and tried than Job. And, and we know that we can learn from his life as he went through those trials. So he's a man that's perfect. He's a man that's upright. And then he feared God as well. Job chapter 1, verse 1, it says, A man that was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. Throughout the scriptures, the concept of fearing God deals with having respect for God um, and respecting his position. Uh, the truth is that our almighty God is, is God above all, and there's no one else beside him. And beside Jesus Christ, there is no Savior. And... Uh, one, one of the greatest important facts about your life is your relationship with God. In fact, that is the most important truth about your life. How do you relate to God? Number one, are you saved? Do you have a relationship with your God? And then secondly, are you walking in fellowship with Him? And do you respect Him? Do you respect His position? Job certainly had a holy respect for God. Uh, he understood and he clearly stated throughout the book that God is the creator of the universe. Uh, the things that he saw in creation could not have occurred without God's intervention. Uh, he, he understood and, and realized that God had all power and that he could trust God. So, so God, God wants his creation to fear him. Um, does that mean I'm cowering in fear of God? No, if I'm right with God, if I'm saved, then I don't have to face his wrath and I can have a fellowship with a father. That's what God says. We cry, Abba, Father. We've received the spirit of adoption Throughout at our salvation. So we don't have to be fearful of God, but there should always be a healthy respect for God. God is still God. He's, he's far above us. And so that will please God. And then, and then thirdly, Job eschewed evil. Job eschewed evil. Um, Hannah, I don't know what that word means. I had to look it up. And eschewed, well, he didn't chew about evil. He, he shunned it. He avoided it. He fled from evil. 
So when he saw evil, he, he ran the opposite direction. Think about Joseph. He was presented with opportunity to sin. What did he do? He left his coat and he ran. That's what Job did. He's a faithful man. He, he ran from evil. He shunned evil. He, he avoided evil. God's plan for us is to do two things. One is to love righteousness, and the second thing is to hate evil. Uh, The complete opposite of that is is found in the world. The world wants us to play. Hey, just give it a go. Just try this. Just just check this out. Just see how close you can get to sin without falling off the cliff. God wants us to run from evil. He'd rather we were further away from it than closer to it. And so that comes about as you fear God, as you start to align yourself with who God is and His holiness and His character. Well, you're going to try and do those things that please Him. And so we need to eschew evil. Uh, Let's go over to Psalm chapter 97 and verse number 10. Psalm 97 and verse number 10. And then I want to pick up another verse in Hebrews. Psalm 97 and verse 10. The Bible says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Hey, hey, do you love God this morning? What he says is, I want you to hate evil. Hey, Jeremy, you love me? Okay, I need you to hate evil. Hate sin. That's what he says. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. If you love God, then there'll be a corresponding hatred of evil. And then let's go to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 9. This is testimony of Jesus Christ. In fact, we'll pick it up in verse number 8 just for the context. Hebrews chapter 1 verse number 8. The example is set by Jesus Christ. He did this. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8, the Bible says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And there it is. God did two things. He said about his son, Hey, he loved righteousness, but he hated iniquity. They go hand in hand. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. You know, the, um, the mark of the kingdom of Jesus Christ is his righteousness. Because it says there in verse number eight, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. When Jesus Christ sits on the throne and he holds his scepter, it's a scepter of righteousness. That's a good, a good characteristic of the, of the kingdom of God is his righteousness. It's going to be marked by that. We see a lot of kingdoms and uh, powers that be in this world that are not marked by righteousness. There's a lot of wickedness and corruption and sin. Well, Jesus Christ's kingdom, we can bank on this, is, is a, it's a righteous kingdom. And we can be part of that. We are part of that if you're saved. Um, Acts 24 verse 16, if you want to turn over there. Um, don't be afraid to look at your Bible this morning. Um, Acts 24 16. It's, the truth is that it's the Word of God that will build you up. It's the Word of God that's able to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. Acts 24 verse 16. This is Paul's testimony. Paul standing before... Felix. He's um, been accused of being a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes and he's a stirrer of strife and a pestilent fellow and so he's going to give testimony about himself and this is what he says, Acts 24, 16, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Hey, so, so, so Paul is standing to give an account of his life before this, this ruler, Felix. And he says, I always exercise myself in two ways. Number one, that I can have my conscience void of offense towards God. God, I'm right with you. As far as I know, my conscience bears witness, I'm right with you. But, but he doesn't forget about his fellow men because they're watching his life. And so my brethren and my countrymen, hey, I'm right with you as well. I'm doing the right thing by you guys. You know, if we're correct with God this way, we're going to be correct with our fellow men this way. If we're having struggles in this dimension with our relationships in life, it's probably because we're off kilter with God somehow. And so first focus on your relationship with God. Walk with God and then you'll be able to walk well with others and have that conscience that doesn't offend others. Void of offense. So we see his testimony. So 
he's a man that he, he, he's upright and perfect. He, he fears God and he eschews evil. He runs away from, he avoids, he shuns evil. He's a godly man. I think we'd agree that Job is a very godly man. So then we come to his trials. We see his testimony, but now we see his trials. Well, trials can reveal the depth and character of my Christian walk, of my heart for God. You know, what they, what they say, um, Jim Berg in his study of um, change into his image, what he says there is this, that, um, that, that what's in the tea bag is going to come out. So let's say you have a cup of tea this morning. You have your cup, you have a tea bag, and you add some hot water, and whatever's in that tea bag is what's going to come out into the flavor of the tea. And you're going to taste that, because whatever's in the bag is going to come out. And that's the reality of trials in the Christian life, is that the hot water situations of life, the troubles, the trials that we go through, it reveal what's in our tea bag. So you taste your tea, tea and you, you don't like the flavor. Well, chances are the, it's, it's not the hot water. It's, it's what's inside my life that's coming out that I don't like. So if I see things in my life that I'm going through some trouble and I see my response is fear or maybe it's discouragement or maybe it's doubting God, maybe I need to work on my faith. Maybe I need to work on my courage. Maybe I need to work on my joy. And these things will then start to come out of my life when the trial comes, when the hot water comes in. So trials reveal the depth of a person's character. And, you know, trials as a Christian, they can make you or they can break you. And it's really in your hands how that, how that goes. Um, none of us have control over what will happen in our lives. We, we don't know what happens today, this afternoon. We walk out of this building um, in the week to come. We don't know. God knows, but we don't know. But we, we do have control over our responses. So tomorrow when you go to work and you face a colleague or a manager that's had a bad weekend and they've got a bad attitude and they've got a bad spirit, well, you can't control that. But you can control how you respond to them. And you think about the challenges of just home life. You know, you've got to go home and deal with chores and cleaning and cooking and housework and just managing the, the busyness of life. And we can sometimes get on our our spirit a bit and we can start to get a bit cranky or frustrated. Well, how are we going to respond? Are we going to let those things affect us and we're always dictated by our circumstances or are we going to start responding in the spirit? And as John said to us on Wednesday night, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The, 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 the greatest issue we have as believers is we're really struggling to walk in the spirit. And we let the spirit have his way in our life, then we're going to respond correctly. There's a story here in the, in the textbook that I'm using about a great um, tragedy that happened to a family. And I read through it yesterday and it's quite, it's quite horrible, to be honest. I, I'm not going to read it here. And, and we don't need to. We, we all know what trouble is, right? We've all been through some trouble. We've all lost someone that we love or seen, seen a financial difficulty or maybe a health situation. Uh, maybe a friend that we really loved. Then they're, they're no longer our friend because God or circumstances or something separated us. We, we all understand what it is to go through some trouble. So I don't need to try and fill in the blanks for you or give you illustrations, but, but you, you apply this to yourself. You, you've been through some trouble. Um, how will you respond? How, how will you respond? And you may have just been through some. You may be going to go through some in the future. Maybe you're going through something right now. Um, how are you going to respond? First of all, let's look at Job's financial trials. Let's go back to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Job was really attacked in three areas. First of all, his finances. His, his prosperity, his wealth. For, for context, we need to read um, verses 2 and 3. Yeah, Job chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. It's a strong statement. This man's very rich. He's very wealthy, has a lot of possessions. He, he has a lot of capacity. This man has a lot of power. It's the greatest of all the men of the East. That's a, it's a big statement. You know, you read your Bible, there's no exaggeration. When he's the greatest of all the men of the East, he's the greatest of all the men of the East. He's a great man. And so what happens down in verse number uh, 13? 
if you read with me. There was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So he lost his oxen and his asses. Then let's go in verse 16. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. There he loses his sheep. And verse number 17. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands, and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And there he loses his, his camels. And even verse 18, if we read that just for the context, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. This is a difficult day in Job's life. I mean, that's an understatement. I don't know how else to say it. He lost everything he had. In one day. Um, talk about shock. Talk about despair. Talk about sorrow. Talk about a, a reason to sit down and just be uh, speechless. Uh, maybe grieving and great. I don't know how to describe it. Everyone responds differently to trouble. He lost everything. And it was just one after the next, after the next, after the next. He just lost it. Um, the Bible says, while he was yet speaking in verse 16. Verse 17, while he was yet speaking. Verse 18, while he was yet speaking. Job didn't get a chance. It was just one after the next, after the next. And that's what the devil will do. As a side note, the devil is a roaring lion. He is a murderer from the beginning. The devil has no mercy. He is a thief. He is a destroyer. God allowed this in Job's life. But it was the devil who thought, oh, God, if, if, you, if you take all of these things from him, if you punish him and you, you, punish, you take away his health, you take away his, his possessions, the only reason, God, that he loves you and he worships you and he honors you is because of all the blessings you've given to him. And God said, okay, I'll let you touch them. I will take away my hand from those things. They're in your power. You do with them as you will, but you can't touch Job. Don't lay your hand upon Job. And Satan goes and he doesn't just play with one thing. He touches it all. And that's what the devil will do. He has no mercy whatsoever. But the first area that Satan attacked Job was in his finances. Between the fire, the Sabaeans, the Chaldeans, Job found his wealth completely destroyed. Um, 1, Timothy 16, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, Paul said to, the, to Timothy, he said, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. Uncertain riches but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. You know, our confidence as believers is not in how much money we've got in the bank because they're uncertain. The Bible says they can fly away quickly. Uh, Luke 12 verse 15, Jesus said this, A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. So you look at your life and all the things you possess. Your life doesn't consist in that. So don't take your life and equate it to all your possessions because God can take away all those possessions and you still have your life. And you still have your security in Christ and you still have a home in heaven. So, so we've got to be careful with that because we like things. I like things. I mean, I broke a glass in our home this morning. I was like, this only lasted me two months, not even. I'm just drying the dishes and snap, uh-oh, broke my glass. I feel really disappointed with myself because I, I like to have stuff. Man's life doesn't consist in the abundance of it. I didn't cut myself. I'm, I'm all good. But you know what? Things come and go. Riches come and go. And... Uh, don't, don't put too much weight or emphasis on your riches or things you have because they're uncertain, the Bible says. You know what you're supposed to do is lay out for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't corrupt, thieves can't break through or steal. In fact, that's where your heart's going to be if your treasure's there. So you want your heart to be in heaven and where God is? Then do some things in your life that will put treasure in heaven for yourself because it can't be touched. It's very secure up there. So we see his, his financial tri trials and troubles, and then we see his family troubles. Look at Job chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. This would be probably the hardest thing. While he was yet speaking, 
there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Uh, it's, it's hard to think of one child being killed, let alone all of them in one hit, just like that, just gone. Um, and that, in fact, that's the illustration that was given in this textbook. It's a story of a pastor and his wife and they have nine children and they lose six of them in a car accident, just like that. How hard, how hard that is. Very, very sad. Um, I'm not a dad, so I don't know this, but those of you that are dads, those of you that are mums, I dare say that you would rather die than let your child die. I'm sure of that. Uh, you'd rather not see your child go through trouble and death. You'd rather face that for them if you could. Job, Job lost all of his children. And yet Job maintains his faith. He maintains his spirit for the Lord. Look at verse 20. Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. I see three responses here. I see first of all this humility. It says Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head and fell down upon the ground. Job took his coat and he rent it. He ripped it apart. And then he shaved his head and he gets down on the ground and he worships his God. Everything, he's, he's, his possessions are taken away. Um, his, his riches are gone. He's no longer the greatest of the men of the East because he's lost it all. And then he loses his children and he goes down on the ground and he worships his God and he says, naked came I out of my mother's womb and I'm going to go back naked. Lord, you're blessed. Blessed be your name. That's what he said. So I see his, his humility. I see his worship. It says, verse 20, at the end of the verse, it says he worshiped. I know that my response with trouble is, it's not the default is not to worship. Default is to cry, grieve, mourn, be discouraged, maybe go quiet. Some of us grieve in different ways. Some of us just clam up and don't say anything. Some of us just cry like there's no tomorrow. All of us grieve in different ways. But, but, but Job worshipped God. I, 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 I don't want to go through what he went through. But I have a lot of respect for his response. It's a very good response. He worshipped his God. And he realized that God had given him everything and that God could take it away. And that doesn't change when, when he has those things. When he doesn't have those things, it doesn't change who his God is. And that's why he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Because God is not changing. So you can wake up this morning having lost everything. And your God is still God. He's still your father. He still loves you. And you still have eternal life. And you still have a home in heaven. Things can't be taken away from you. That those are things that relate to God. And so Job maintained his faith and we see here in chapter 2 and verse number 3. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. God said the same thing about Job here in chapter 2 that he said to Satan in chapter 1. So the testimony of Job is unchanged through the trial. God can say the same things about this faithful man before the trial and after the trial. But he actually adds something. He says, and still he holdeth fast his integrity. Pastor preached on this, about integrity. And Job held that integrity fast in spite of the trial. And now Job is going to face a physical trial, a personal trial for himself. Satan says to the Lord in verse 4, Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So Satan says to God, You know what? All of those possessions that he had, 
he'll, he'll give it for his life. But if you touch his health, you touch his life, he's going to curse you to your face. And God says, mm, he, he's not going to do that. But I want you to go and find that out. And so the Lord says to Satan, behold, he's in your hand, but you cannot touch his life. So you can hurt him, but you can't, you can't take his life. So verse 7, so, Satan, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Sh shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Those boils would have been um, very unsightly, would have looked horrible, very disfiguring. And then it would have been very painful. And he, he takes a bit of uh, potsherd, like a broken vessel and a bit of a sharp edge, and he scrapes himself. So he's scraping those boils to try and relieve some of that pain, some of that stuff that builds up under. It's gross. It's disgusting. He's covered from head to toe in these boils. No one would want to be... Like if you see... Um, things that have happened to people after they've been injured, maybe burns and so forth. It's very unsightly. And our natural response, if we're not merciful, is to be like, oh, to shudder and to think that's horrible. And that's probably what most people would have seen when they saw Job. They thought, oh, that's disgusting. That's, I don't want to look at that. So people around him would have seen that and he himself experienced it. What does he do? He takes this sharp pot shirt and he scrapes himself and he sits among the ashes. This is about as low as he can get. And then you add this in verse 9. His wife says to him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. The one that could have supported him at that time was his wife, because he still had his wife. And that's his God, I guess, ordained companion and help that's meet for him and one that's his, part of his flesh, the, the one flesh. And, and she says, What are you doing? Just, God is not faithful. Curse him and die. Be done with this. Don't, what, are you, what are you holding on to your integrity for? I think that would have been, that is as low as he could have got. Having his own wife, I guess, kick him in the guts in that sense, if I can say it like that. He's down and then he gets kicked. You know what, what we learn from that as believers? If somebody's going through a trial, our job is not to come along and question them and, hey, you know, so why are you still trusting your God? And hey, you've been faithful. Hey, hey, our job is to be an encouragement. Our job is to be a blessing. Our job is to come and lift and exhort and help and be a friend. And we've got to be so careful with our words when some other people are going through trouble. And at the end of verse 10, it says, In all this did not Job sin with his lips. He, he had a good, godly response to these troubles. So it's pretty, pretty discouraging thinking about all of this. He's had so many blessings and and riches and he had a good testimony but he lost it all in one day and and now what, what are we left with well he he's it's him and god and that's it and the next 30 odd chapters in the book of job it's job talking with his friends his friends are kind of explaining to him why they think that job's going through these hard times hey you, you know you're going through this because of your sin you're going through this because god's judging you job and and Job tries to understand God, and God, why have you done this to me? And it would, it would have been better for me not to have ever been born than to go through this. And there's a lot of questions, and there's a lot of hurt, and there's a lot of sorrow, and there's a lot of back and forth and back and forth between these three friends of his and Job. And, and that goes on for some time, this long conversation. Let's go to Job chapter 42. We don't have the time, I guess, to go through all of that in detail. Read it for yourself. But Job chapter 42, right at the end of the story. Where does Job end up? And we know that Job's finish is good. We know he ends well. This is the response that he has at the very end of the trouble. Job chapter 42. And we're going to read the first six verses. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not 
things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Hold on, I thought Job was a man that feared God and eschewed evil. I thought Job was perfect and upright. I thought he was a man of integrity. So what is he repenting of? What is he, why is he abhorring himself and repenting in dust and ashes? Why is he doing that? Well, because he comes face to face with who God is. He'd heard of him, but now he sees him with his own eye. And that's his response. And that is the response of all people that have come face to face with their God is a response of, God, I am nothing. You're everything. And coming face to face with God's holiness and his power and his might, Job realized, God, you're God and I'm, I can't question you. I've got to trust you. God uses trials and tribulation, tribulations to shape us, just like a sculptor uses a hammer and chisel to shape the stone, or as a potter uses kneading and pressure and heat to make bowls and vases. True quality does not come quickly, easily, or cheaply. Things that are truly valuable often require much time and work for their production. You know, examples of that would be some handcrafted watches, some handmade shoes, or the work that goes into uh, Steinway pianos. Let me give you this illustration here. The Steinway piano has been preferred by keyboard masters such as Rachmaninoff, um, I'm going to butcher these pronunciations, Horowitz, Van Cliburn, and, and Liszt. These are mus musical composers. Um, the Steinway piano has been preferred by them for a good reason. It's a skillfully crafted instrument that produces phenomenal sound. Steinway pianos are built today the same way they were over 150 years ago when Henry Steinway started his business. And get this, 200 craftsmen and 12,000 parts are required to produce just one of these magnificent instruments. So it's a lot of work that goes in. Most crucial is the rim bending process, where 18 layers of maple are bent around an iron press to create the shape of a Steinway grand piano. Five coats of lacquer are applied and then hand rubbed to give the piano its outer glow. The instrument then goes to the pounder room where each key is tested 10,000 times to ensure quality and durability. Talk about a process, talk about a lot of work just to make a musical instrument. And I'm glad that Sister Amy's not here. I probably butchered some pronunciations there, but you ask Sister Amy about Steinway, I'm pretty sure she'll, I guess she'll give you a, an answer that, yeah, these are good quality products. Is there, are there any other piano players? Hannah, you play piano, right? So am I correct? Are these, we're all ignorant, I guess. Ignorance is bliss, isn't it? Well, uh, if, if that's incorrect, then we can blame the, 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 the textbook. The point is this. There's a lot of work that goes in to make a grand piano. To make a, Makai, you'd know. Your mom is all about music and music, musicians and all that stuff. Anyway, the point is this. A lot of work. A lot of hand handiwork. Um, a lot of people involved. A lot of time. And there's rim bending. So they have to take this, this maple wood and they bend it around an iron press to create the right shape. Um, if you look at Ephesians chapter, four, uh, chapter 2 and verse 10, we'll, we'll, we'll turn there. Ephesians 2 verse 10. God is doing a similar process in our lives, right? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. The point is this. The piano goes through that production process so that it can produce beautiful quality music. It can look beautiful. It can sound beautiful. People will enjoy using it. Ephesians 2 verse 10. The Bible says this, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Don't be surprised if God does some things in your life that will shape you, that will change you. They might hurt. They might be uncomfortable. They might not be what you expect. It might be a trial. The point of that is not just to hurt you, the point is to make you and to shape you and to change you in such a way that God can use you for His glory. We're God's workmanship. Let Him be the workman. We need to just respond and submit in faith to His work in our life. Two things and we'll be done. Number one, um, as we see Job's triumph here at the end, we see his enlightenment. We read about it in Job 42. He realized... Um, 
who, who God was and he understood himself in, in perspective of who God was and he repented in dust and ashes. You know, there was a point in his trial where he said, God, why are you doing this to me? I'm paraphrasing, but he was asking God, God, why? Give me a reason. Give me an understanding so I can know why I'm going through this hard time. And it's true that God does not need to give a reason. God is not obliged. He's not obligated to give us a reason why we're going through something difficult. The reason I can say that is in Job chapter 33, it says about God that he, giveth, he doesn't have to give account of any of his matters. God is not accountable to anyone. So God doesn't have to report to someone, this is why I'm doing this in Jeremy's life. Uh, this is why this church is going through this trouble. This is why uh, this person died. This is why this person's sick. This is why this person lost their wealth uh, because of these reasons. God does not need to give an account. And so our best response is not to try and figure out why, but just to say, God, please use this trial in my life to achieve what you need to achieve. One of the saddest things you can go through is go through a trial and then never really benefit from it, never really profit from it. Um, let me give you some reasons why you might go through trial. Number one, to produce some fruit. Number two, to silence the devil. The devil took away from this, um, this illustration of Job is that you can touch a godly man and you can touch all that he has, but if he's a man that walks with God and he fears God and he eschews evil and he's got integrity, you can take all those things away, but he's still going to worship God. And the devil was wrong. The devil was wrong. Job did not just fear and worship God because of the blessing in his life. Job did that because he loved God. So silence the devil. Thirdly, we can glorify God through the trial. Fourthly, it can make us like Christ. Uh, number five, we can, be, we can be taught how to depend on God. Number six, it can refine our lives and purify us. Uh, number seven, rebukes our sin. Sometimes the trial is about chastening and God is, is dealing with us as with sons, as with fathers. He will chasten us to get our attention and turn our attention back to Him. And then finally, He can enlarge our ministry to someone else. If you go through a trial, then you experience God's comfort. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians that you can then take that comfort and be a comfort to someone else. And so uh, if you've been through a trial, be prepared to steward that trial for somebody else's benefit. So Job is enlightened at the end. Um, he, he, he didn't have to understand the reason, but he just needed to see God and he needed to see himself. And that was enough. And then secondly, and we're done, Job was not only enlightened, but he was also enriched. If you go back to Job chapter 42, um, we see the end of the story. It's a good thing. Job chapter 42 And I get you guys all, all know the story of Job and we've covered stuff that's very familiar territory today. Um, I'm not apologizing. I'm just saying that. Thank you for bearing with me. And sometimes it's just good to be reminded of some things. Uh, Job 42. And we're going to look here at verse 12 and 13. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and a thousand she-asses. If you go back to chapter 1, that is twice, exactly twice, the number of um, animals in each of those categories that he previously had. God doubled his blessing. He took it all away, and then he gave him twice as much back. In verse 13, he had also seven sons and three daughters. God gave him back the exact number of children. Amazing. Seven sons and three daughters. God blessed him. This is one thing that we can say in really simple terms. Romans 8, 28. Brother Warren used to uh, remind us of this all the time. And he said, he'd say it like this, and we know, he wouldn't say we think or we hope, but we know. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. He'd sign his cards like that. He'd sign his emails like that. Romans 8, 28. And we don't always understand why we go through stuff, but we do know according to the scripture, it's going to work out for our good. So God's ways are much higher than our ways. He doesn't have to explain himself to us. What we need to do with the trouble and trial in our life is trust him. And we need to, we need to have faith in our God. Don't, if you're going through trouble, don't lose your faith and courage in who your God is. Don't be discouraged. It's easy for me to say that, don't dwell in discouragement, if I can say that. Don't just stay down in the ashes, scraping yourself and feeling sorry for yourself. No, get up and 
and look to your God and realize he's on the throne. He's on the throne. He's in control. He still loves you. He has a purpose and a plan for your life that maybe you don't understand right now, but he'll still be good. And God will do good through that trouble. And so we can be assured of the fact that we can receive that enrichment, that blessing from the Lord when we remain faithful to him. So the life of Job, Hannah, is a challenge to every believer today to live in a holy and a God-pleasing manner, no matter what trials may come. The end. All right, let's, uh, let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. Uh, memory verse for next week for those who are in my class. Let's do this. Job chapter 1, verse 1. Just keep it simple. Job 1, 1. And let's pray, shall we? Our Father, we thank you for your word. And um, we, we've read about Job many times. We know his patience. We know his faithfulness. Father, we are not exempt from trouble. And thank you, Lord, that you're acquainted with our griefs. You're acquainted with our sorrows. You understand what we go through. And I pray that as we go through things, whether individually or as a family or as a church, that we would be faithful to trust you and faithful to keep our eyes on you. And Lord, even if we never understand why something took place or what was the reason for the trial, help us, Lord, to just be, just be faithful in our place and to recognize your good hand in spite of all the trouble we face. We ask that you'd bless the main service to come. And we thank you and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.